Amen. As we talked about last week, Paul's letter to the, to the church in Ephesus is what we call a circular letter, meaning that it was sent to the, to the Ephesians, and then it was passed on to the other churches in the area. So any of these letters that Paul wrote, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, all of these were sent to that church, but then they would cycle around so that other people would read it as well. Because of this, Paul speaks in ways that apply to the whole church, the big C church, and that includes us. Ephesians is focused on the church, what, what life in and as the church looks like and how the gospel brings us together around Jesus Christ. Last week we listened as the Apostle Paul opened his letter to the Ephesians telling them who they are in Christ, who they are, telling us that we are chosen, that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of God, that we have been redeemed are chosen we are chosen by God that is it's just I don't even know what to think by that think about that it's just amazing God chose us but now Paul moves forward in this section to describe to us what God wants us to have and what he wants us to know and so we're gonna look at these things as we listen to the rest of Ephesians chapter 1 this morning I actually where's that Mike? can uh, you're gonna find a volunteer that's going to read this to us this morning. So this is Ephesians, it's going to be on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. You've got to come up here, Isaac. You can't read it from back there. Isaac texted me what I was going to do for Mother's Day, and I said, I'm going to hang out with my fiance, because she's a mother. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, thanks, man. Here you go. So Isaac, you can read it off the screen. I've got it on the iPad, however you want to do it. But can you read? This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And I hope you all can hear me. Hold the mic a little higher. Can you all hear me now? There we go. It feels a little awkward, but I can do this. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you can constantly asking God the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow your in your knowledge of God I pray that your heart will be flooded with light so that you can um, understand the confident hope he has given to those he he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand incredible, the incredible greatness of God's power for, the, for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over things for the benefit of the church and the church in his body, it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Huh. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Everybody knows that. Well, did you know genies can be really literal? No. What is your wish? No. <laughs> okay. A million bucks. Oh, no. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Huh. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Everybody knows that. Well, did you know genies can be really literal? No. Just the 
There we go. <laughs> uh, how many of you have ever uh, dreamed of uh, finding a genie in a bottle? <laughs> Just for fun. If you only had three wishes, what would you ask for? Love. Okay, just because we're in church doesn't a mean a helicopter. <laughs> what? Yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Y yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow? I was like, okay. I can get you that. <laughs> tomorrow's Wall Street Journal. I mean, when you were kids, what were the things that you wished for when you, when you wish, oh, like, if you had three wishes, because most of us have probably played this game before. A pony. Yes, there we go. What? An, an island. Ooh, that'd be fun. More wishes. Always wishing for more wishes, yeah. <laughs> A million bucks, of course, yes. The, the thing is, uh, when, we, when we think of those things, it, it's easy for us when we're in church, we think, oh, I would wish for love and peace and stuff. But if we're honest with ourselves, some of those aren't necessarily, while they might pop into our head, we're like, oh yeah, but a, a million bucks would be nice too. <laughs> um, but the thing is, the things we ask for shows us where our heart is actually. Kind of what we ask God for can tell us a lot about our hearts and our priorities. The things that we usually take to God in prayer are often at the center of our lives. So what do you, what do you most often pray for? Family? Health, kids? Financial concerns, health issues, school, job? How many of you have ever prayed to do well on a test before? <laughs> we often pray for our circumstances and the, the places that we find ourselves and it's good to pray for these things but it's interesting to me because the prayers that we find recorded in the Bible are often radically different than the prayers most of us pray they're often radically different than the prayers that I pray 10 years ago a national survey found that more than half of Americans said that they pray daily but in spite of that, I can tell you that after over 30 years of ministry, most people, in my experience, feel like their prayer lives are kind of weak. And, and maybe this is, maybe that's how you feel. But it's, to me, it, it's interesting because while, while that tends to be the sentiment in every single church I've ever pastored and in every ministry situation I've ever served in, Getting people together to pray, to gather together and pray, is one of the most difficult things to do, and even more difficult to sustain. And so it's no wonder that we might feel like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of, this is a weak area. I, I, the thing that I was thinking about, I think somebody from outside the church who observed how we live would be maybe not most shocked, but, but maybe most shocked, not at the way, not because we also struggle with sin, or some of them might be a little surprised at how little we know about the Bible sometimes. Um, but I think one of the things they would be most shocked about if they knew anything about Christianity is how little we pray how little we show that we value prayer. Many prayers are quick and formulaic, and we often only pray when we have to. At church, gotta have prayer time. At meals, somebody say grace. When we need something, we pray. But these are far removed from the substantial and powerful and passionate prayers that you would expect from a people who believe, because I know we believe this, from a people who believe that the creator of the universe is listening to what we pray 
and answers these prayers. Like, if we believe this, people will be like, oh my goodness, really? The creator of the universe listens to what you pray and he answers prayer? Why don't you pray more? That's amazing. And, and it, ask yourself this question. I, I struggled with this a little bit this week. Ask yourself this question. I, I've often heard the question, would the community notice if your church just disappeared all of a sudden? And, but I thought of a different variation of that. Ask yourself this question. How would your life change if prayer didn't exist? How would this church change if prayer didn't exist? Like if, if there was no references, all the stuff in the Bible, it didn't say anything about prayer, would that change how, how we go about our daily lives? Now, now we know it would radically change because there are people praying for what's going on, but in our day-to-day -day life, if prayer actually didn't exist, how much would your life change? That's a scary question because many of my days, maybe not many, but some of my days wouldn't be that different. And I want you to know that I'm not standing up here pointing fingers and picking on you and saying, fix your pitiful prayer lives. <laughs> I'm a part of this. And I want us to move toward a vibrant and a powerful prayer life. That this is such a part of everything that we do. Why? Because there is nothing that will change this church, that will change your life more than the power of prayer. Everything that you read about in the, in the Bible, in God's word, all the times, all the things that God is doing came as a result of people praying. The stories that we hear of God doing things in the world, those come as a result of people praying. Yesterday we celebrated with the Teach One to Lead One mentors. As they finished up the school year and they were thanking them for all the things that they had done, the ways they have served all this last year. If you, there are a few of you who volunteered with Teach One to Lead One this year. We have several. Since September, these volunteers have gone into the public school. Some of them right across the street here, some of them downtown, have gone into the public school and shared the love of God in the public school every single week since September. And yesterday when we, when we celebrated all that God has done and listened to the stories from some of the principals of the school of the impact that this has had on their children, on their students. It was unbelievable. But one of the stories that was shared, they went around and asked, who's volunteered for a year, for two years, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then they brought up one lady who she's like, she said, oh, I've only volunteered for eight years. And they said, well, that's not entirely true. <laughs> She's only been in the schools eight times over the course of the last 20 some years. But there was a group of ladies over two decades ago who went to the Vancouver Public School District and said, Do you have this, we have this amazing program called Teach One to Lead One. And we'd like to bring it into the schools here. And whoever was a leader at that time said no. But these ladies said, that's not good enough. And they started to pray. They prayed faithfully for 10 years, every week for 10 years before God opened that door. And today, there have been more than 800 students who have been impacted by this. Because people were willing to pray and say, that's not good enough.
I don't accept the way things are out there because my God has overcome. And my God can open any door. Anyway, as we look at this, this next text this morning, I'd like us to focus on three questions. Why does Paul pray for the Ephesians? Because in the second half, he opens with verses 1 to 20, 1 to 14. And then in the passage we just heard that Isaac read for us, we ask the questions, why did Paul pray for the Ephesians? What does he pray for the Ephesians? And why does he pray for them to see God's power, which answered the other question I just said. <laughs> But first, why does Paul pray for the Ephesians? Listen to verses 15 and 16 again. Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not, not stopped thanking God for you. I pray constantly. Paul begins by telling them that he prays constantly for them. And I love how the, the message paraphrase says it this way. It says, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Because the feeling here is like Paul can't not pray for them. It's like, it's almost like it's impossible for him to not pray for them. And the thing that's interesting here is, I, I, I wonder, do you, do you think it was difficult for Paul to find time to pray? And we, we might think, oh, of course not, it's Paul. But think about Paul's life. He wasn't a monk living in the desert with nothing to do except pray. Paul was bivocational. He had a regular job. He worked. He ministered. He planted churches all over Asia Minor. He preached. He trained leaders. He wrote letters. He followed up with all this stuff. He was a busy guy. Probably had a thousand thoughts racing through his mind at any given moment. I wonder how this church is doing. I wonder how Barnabas is doing. I wonder how so-and-so is doing and all. And yet... He was always praying. He was always praying. We get so distracted and we're so busy that we often find that we don't have time to pray. And so what could make somebody who is as busy as Paul lay all of that down and drive them to turn to God in prayer at every moment? One of the things that we see from this passage is, is that Paul's praises turn into prayers really quickly. His prayers just kind of flow out of his praises for all that God has done. This passage, th this verses 15 to 23 that we read, um, follow verses 1 through 14. And, and I think Paul failed grammar lessons um, in school because it's nice for us in English and it's broken up into different sentences, but in the book of Ephesians, verses 3 through 14 in the Greek are one single sentence. Paul is famous for these ridiculously long run-on sentences. We don't get that because they clean it up for us when they translate into English and it makes them sound nice, but... He like had these huge, so verses 3 through 14 is this one long run on sentence because he's so excited about everything that God's doing. And he just keeps going and going and going and going. And immediately following that, Paul flows right into this prayer. Right into this prayer because he saw the greatness of God at work in the Ephesian church. And he was compelled as he's praising, just to, it turns into praying and talking with God. What drove Paul to pray here in this opening of this letter was not a problem. There was no issue. There was nothing he needed. What drove him to pray was the greatness of his vision for all that God was doing and God's greatness. I think this, this is a rhythm sometimes that we, that we miss. We are often driven to pray because we have an overwhelming desire for God to fix our problems. Paul, on the other hand, is driven to pray because he is overwhelmed by the glory of God. That radically changes our perspective. What do we have our eyes fixed on? The overwhelming problems we see all around us or the overwhelming glory of 
the one who is in control. Paul is moved to pray because he's praising. He's also moved to pray because he's passionate about God's work in the lives of others. We don't know from this letter what Paul's so excited about in the church in Ephesus. Maybe he was hearing about how they, they shared their wealth with one another, how they cared for the community, how they were fearless in the face of economic pressure from the trade guilds, because we know that took place. How they were bearing one another's burdens. Were they evangelistic? The church was growing. All these things, whatever it was, Paul was so excited about what was happening in the Ephesian church that he was just overflowing with prayers and praise for them. I think Paul always stayed focused on sometimes what we miss. Again, what God is doing, where he is at work. This is, this is what we focus on. Like, God, where are you at work? What are you doing? We fix our eyes on Jesus, not on the circumstances around us. The church is at the center of God's plan for restoring the world, and God is always at work among us. Always. Always. That alone should be enough to make us, to drive us to pray and say, God, wow, thank you. Where can I join you? And Paul also prays because he knows that God is responsible for all that happens in the lives of of the church in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus. As he opens this letter, he doesn't praise the Ephesian church for all that they're doing. Oh, your outreach program was amazing last week. You reached so many people and you fed so many people through this. We don't know why he's praising God for this church because he doesn't give the list of all the accomplishments of the church because it doesn't really matter. He knows that all that is happening in the church is because of God. And therefore, he thanks God for what he is doing. Therefore, helping the Ephesian church also fix their eyes on God and say, wow, yeah, look all that God has done through us. Here's the deal. When, when we have a, a weak prayer life and we feel like our prayer life is a little bit I like, ah, I just, it's not what I want it to be. I feel like it's kind of weak. That leads to a, a weak view of God. And I, I cringe at saying that because I don't feel like I have a weak view of God. But I've, sometimes if I look at my prayer life, I'm like, do I really understand who I'm praying to here? This is God, the creator of the universe. Why does Paul pray? We see that Paul's praying in this letter because he is in awe of all that God is doing. He is in awe. And so we see why he's praying for them, but what does he pray? So imagine, imagine that you're a Christian at Ephesus at this time, that Paul's writing the letter. So if you were a Christian at this time, you would have probably only been a Christian for maybe a few years, maybe, maybe even less probably haven't even seen Paul, the church planter, in at least four years. You're a member of a religion that is considered foolish by the culture around you. People are hostile to you sometimes. And in addition to all of that, you have the regular stresses of marriage, work, parenting, and all the other stuff going on in your life. So what do you feel like you need in this moment? Maybe a better job. Maybe a raise. Maybe more food. Protection from the threats against you because of your faith. That would prob probably be pretty high on my list. Maybe you wish you had a nicer boss. Maybe they needed help with their kids. Help overcoming fear or doubts or some sin that they're struggling with. And then you get a letter from Paul. Like, come this Sunday. Because we got a letter from Paul and we're going to read it. And we want to find out what Paul's praying for us. And Paul prays. Paul starts with, I pray for you constantly. It's just that encouragement, like, wow, Paul's praying for us. 
says, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are rich, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Not a single word from Paul about having a comfortable life that their jobs get better, that they somehow avoid persecution. Tim Keller writes in his book called Prayer, it's remarkable that in all of his writings, Paul's prayers for his friends contain no appeals for changes in their circumstances. That's fascinating. Not once does he pray that their circumstances change. What does he pray? He prays that God opens the eyes of their heart. Praying, he prays that you will know God better. This is what Paul finds urgent. That they grow in the knowledge of God. That they're enlightened by God so that they can have three things. That they will know the hope of their calling, the riches of God's glorious inheritance for his people, and that they'll understand the incomparably great power that is available to those, who us, to those of us who believe. With all that they had to deal with in their lives, which was all the same stuff we have to deal with, and some things we didn't have to de- don't even have to deal with, but they had all the same stuff. With all the things they had to deal with, Paul prays that that's what they'll see that they'll see where God is at work, that they'll understand his power, that they'll know him more. When you were driving here this morning, what, what, why were you thinking that you were coming here? What did, was it because you wanted to know God better? Yeah. Yeah. We need to see knowing God as the most important thing. Right. It's the most important need in our lives. In Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he says everything else is worthless when compared to the value of knowing Christ Jesus. Sometimes we're tempted to see becoming a Christian as the goal. We've been trained through decades of altar calls and prayers for salvation that our goal, and again, these these are not bad things, trained through decades of the Jesus film. How many people prayed the prayer? How many cards got filled out that lives were set? People accepted Christ. We did it. (gasps) I made it. I'm saved. But becoming a Christian is just the beginning. Just the beginning, not the end of our growing in knowledge of God, of who he is. We always want to strive to grow in our faith, to know more about God, to know God more, and to become more like Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but the more I learn about God, the more I study his word, and the closer I draw to God, the more I really realize how little I know about God, how little I understand, and how much more I want to know. Paul intimately knew this, and his life was turned upside down as he grew in knowledge and relationship with God. In the book, Knowing God, it's an interesting paragraph. It's this idea of why, maybe maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online, and you're like, why do I need to know God? What difference does it make? Look at the world. What difference does it make? I found this this fascinating. In in this book, it says, knowing God is crucially important for the living of our lives. As it would be cruel to an Amazonian tribesman to fly him to London, put him down in London without an explanation, and leave him as one who knew nothing about England or English. And Leave him to fend for himself. It says, so we are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God 
whose world it is and who runs it. The world becomes a strange, mad, and painful place and life in it disappointing and un, a disappointing and unpleasant business when you don't know God. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded with no sense of direction and no understanding of anything that surrounds you. This way you can waste your life and lose your soul. It is vitally important, the most important thing that we know and we continue to grow in our knowledge of who God is and in relationship with him. So the, the, the last thing that Paul prays in this passage is that they would see God's power, that they would see God's power at work within them. And in verses 19 to 23, he says, this is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and that seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. This power, the power working within us is the same power that God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul tells us that we are in a war, not against the things of this earth and the situations that we find ourselves into when we walk out of these doors. We are at war with the spiritual forces of this world. These are the powers that pile temptations and struggles upon you, that put things in your life that push you to the breaking point. Paul says that Christ was raised above all of these things. And if you are in Christ, none of these things have any power over you. All those forces that cause you so much trouble in life, Christ was raised above all of that. He is Lord over all of them. And because that same power is at work within you, None of those things can overcome you. We don't need to say, we, I'm struggling with this sin, I just can't get over it. I can't get over the fear, the greed, the gossip, the addiction to alcohol or pornography or social media or the plethora of other things you could be addicted to today. The power of God that works in you is stronger than all of these. We don't need to make excuses. We don't need to worry and fret. You have the power of God within you. I'm struck by how much Paul's view of God differs from ours. When we pray, we pray, God, do something powerful among us. But Paul doesn't ask God to use his power. Paul's already aware that God is always using his power. He is always at work for the benefit of his church, that the whole world might know who he is. Paul simply says, God, may we see what you're doing. Make us aware of what you're doing so we can join you in this. He wants the Ephesians to see it. Do you struggle to see God as active in your life, in our lives? Paul, again, doesn't think like this. It's not what he's saying in this letter. He's saying God is active. He's alive and active, more active than most of us realize. I know it's hard to believe, but as busy as your life is, God's way busier, doing way more than you could ever imagine. And I think one of the biggest problems in the church today is that sometimes we're blind to God's power and how active he actually is and how he is moving in this world. If we were aware of all that God was doing, we wouldn't be able, like Paul, we wouldn't be able to stop thanking him and stop praising him for all that he is doing. We wouldn't be able to stop telling others about what he's doing. But here's the thing. He is. He is doing all of that. You, you do realize that, that we actually can't do any of this on our own. 
right? This, this living the Christian life, this becoming the church God created us, to, created us to be, we can't do it on our own. It is by Christ, it is through Christ, it is only through Christ that we can do this. And he equips his church. That's us. We do this together. Why does Paul open this letter to the Ephesians like this? Because he's saying you need to understand who God is. His power, all of this stuff you need. Before we get to any kind of teaching that I would teach you, you need to understand who God is. Seeing God at work is incredible motivation for us to pray, to get involved. Because whether you realize it or not, God is powerfully working all around you. And we need to see this. We need to pray for each other that we will see the power of God. Husbands, you need to pray for your wives that they will see the power of God. Wives, you need to pray for your husbands that they will see the power of God. Parents, you need to pray for your children that they will see the power of God at work when they go to school, when they're in the community, that they grow in the knowledge of God. There are few more important things that we can pray for for each other that we would know, that we would know God. We need to pray for our church that our eyes can be opened to see the mighty power of God working in our midst. There are stories. God is working in this church. Do we see it? Are those the stories we're telling? There is nothing that we can't overcome. No arguing, no temptations, no attack from the evil one that Christ has not already conquered. How can we fail when the creator of the universe is the one who goes before us and we simply follow him and say, look what God's doing, I'm going to do that. There's a story about the early African converts. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. There's a story about the early African converts to Christianity who were devout in their personal prayers. Each person had a separate, a separate space in the, in the bushes. It was like their, their private retreat that they would go to uh, in a thicket. And over time, as they would go to these places to pray, the paths would be worn down as they would go back and forth to these times of prayer. But one of the interesting things was is that, that as a result of that, if someone began to neglect their time with God, it became apparent to the others, and they would kindly remind the negligent one, brother, sister, the grass grows on your path. I pray that the grass does not grow on our paths. Let us constantly be in prayer. Because God is here. He is moving in our midst. He is at work all around us every single day. And if we will ask and if we will seek to know God, then he will show us and we will see what he is doing and we can declare his greatness and we can join in what he's doing and we begin to tell the stories of what he's doing and people are like, whoa. We get to talk to the creator of the universe, people. And he listens. He listens to you. Can you believe that? He listens to me. I, that just blows my mind. I pray that we see what God is doing and that we will join him. 
that our hearts will be flooded with his light so that we understand the confident hope he's given to those he has called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. We're just going to close with this song, Waymaker. It says, you are here, moving in our midst. Do you see it? And as you go from this place, look for where God is at work and ask God show me that I might join